in the uh, interest of trying to get ro rocking and rolling here, we'll uh, start with our next uh, multi-modality patient discussion. When I talked originally to Maureen and Jim about what we wanted to do with this session, we wanted to present some cases to one another, uh, again, to let you see how we interact and not so much that there's one answer to every, every question, but rather there are multiple ways to proverbially skin the cat. So I'd like to present a couple of cases that are very straightforward, ha, ha, ha. Uh, a 57-year-old male comes to the office of his local GI guy. He has uh, complaints of chronic reflux and heartburn. He uh, complains of reflux in, into his mouth called the hot water brash or the hot water flush. At the night, he has a history of, of epigastric pain. He's had, quote, peptic ulcer disease in the past, and he has no other significant medical problems. He has no known drug allergies, and what do we do? Uh, so do we need, does this guy need upper GI endoscopy? Does he need a 24-hour acid study with manometry? Does he need a CAT scan? Does he need lab work, and if so, what kind? Etc. Okay, Rod, what, what does this guy need right off the bat? We don't have a gastroenterologist on the panel. Um, I think I would start with upper GI endoscopy. Okay. I would check his helicobacter status up front. Okay, a any lab work this guy needs, you think? Well, is he on his PPI? I mean, obviously we're concerned that he has a gastronomous or a Zollinger Ellison syndrome, but he needs to be off of his PPI and for an undetermined period of time is the problem to determine whether or not. Is it not live? Okay, I'm sorry. I just need Odo, to how long do you have to be off of PPIs, in your opinion, for your chromogranin and gastrin and other things to normalize? Well, it was very interesting. Uh, Dr. Ardell showed that slide yesterday, and I looked at the months, and I think uh, in order to get the chromogranin A down, it took five or six months, and uh, I would certainly do an initial gastrin uh, just to see where you are, and I agree with the thought that uh, the PPI it may be a major issue in terms of the gastrin story here, but I think Dr. Ordeal can comment because she had that data on that slide. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming gastrin was elevated in that. Joy, how long do you, do you have to keep people off of PPIs to get accurate measurements of gastrin and chromogranin? I would want to have them off uh, PPIs for about five days because we'll see a very significant fall if it's not a tumor. Okay, she says uh, five if days. If you want it to come right down to base, well, we don't want it to come right down to base. We want to see that it's a, as a result of PPI therapy uh, or a tumor, and we'll see that in five days. But you have to be cautious because these people, in the past we saw gastronomas that perforated and we, we lost patients. And once we take, off, uh, take them off PPIs, we have to be very cautious. Okay. And I would suggest that they go on to H2 antagonists for five days. You know, it, it, I'd have to say, <clears throat> the longer you're on it, it it's duration related because you get G-cell hyperplasia. Yeah. And once you get the G-cell hyperplasia, uh, the, the cascade, the high gastrin turning on the chromogranin A, uh, is the there's two issues with the gastrin one is as Rod brought up I think namely is this a gastrin could this be a gastrin secreting tumor and B is the high ga is there going to be high gastrin so I think we need to document that I don't know for how long the PPIs were being used but I uh, the our, uh, at least one gastroenterologist says four to six weeks at, and I think uh, Dr. Warner has commented on that before as well and I think he says eight to ten weeks uh, I'm, I'm absolutely sure I remember it, it saying It sort of amazes me that with how long PPIs have been around, which is about 15 plus years, almost 20 years, I guess, that no one's ever really done that study very well. We did this, uh, I did a study with uh, looking at simple, hey, geod Dr. Warner. simple geodenal ulcer and uh, people who were on PPIs and then taken off and they didn't come, if they'd been on PPIs for a year, then their circulating gastrin chromogranin A didn't come down for six months at least. But we're not looking for them to come back down to normal, we're looking for them to uh, come down significantly and 
If it's because of PPIs, they'll come down significantly quite quickly. If it's a tumor, they will not come down at all. Okay. So that's the difference. On endoscopy, his stomach is beefy red. It has a fine background of nodularity. A biopsy of one of the nodules is performed. His lab work shows that he has a very mild anemia. His 24-hour esophageal manometry in acid shows no acid in his esophagus, and the pressure at the LES is normal. Is the problem his PPIs, or does he have something else? Dr. Warner? I didn't hear the beginning, but from... Well, here's a guy who has classic reflux-type symptoms, has been on PPIs on and off since Noah built the ark, and, and now when you endoscope him, his stomach looks beefy red, it's nodular, and he has no acid. Okay. It's a, it sounds as if this gentleman has atrophic uh, gastritis. Is there anything that tells you as a gastroenterologist that somebody has pernicious anemia and atrophic gastritis versus he's been on PPIs for five years, well, the way the stomach looks? PPI doesn't cause atrophic gastritis. Uh, okay, so the, it may the look, cause a, the it, look it, it'll is certainly different. produce achlorhydria right. and changes in some of the markers, such but, as. But uh, the way the stomach looks, if you're an expert like you are, uh, you can tell when you look in there, this doesn't look like the effect of PPIs. This looks different. Absolutely looks different. In fact, uh, sometimes with chronic PPI treatment, we may see little tiny uh, excrescences or nodules and they're quite different from those that are due to uh, ECL cell hyperplasia that often occurs in atrophic gastritis. Okay. The physician decided to retreat him with a round of another PPI for another 12 weeks and the patient fails to return for his three-month visit, of course. The symptoms don't change with the PPIs. He still has what seems like esophageal reflux he has this burning pain at night, and he just, uh, just instead of going back to his gastroenterologist, he just says, well, the heck with it, I'll just take Prilosec, uh, which is over the counter in the U.S., uh, just in case that, that, I, uh, that it makes me feel better. Six months later, after his original visit, he sees his uh, physician with increasing tiredness. He's, his anemia is worse and his biopsy showed enterochromaffin cell hyperplasia, but no evidence of malignancy. What do we need to do with this guy, Richard? Well, we need to uh, uh, alleviate his symptoms, first of all, and stop the PPI treatment. That's not helping at all because he's achlorhedric to begin with. Okay. Uh, he may be having reflux, of course, but it can be alkaline reflux. And that's that, really, for the patients in the room, that's really important. Reflux is reflux. Inflammation is inflammation. And your brain translates inflammation in your esophagus, whether it's alkaline or it's acidic, as the same kind of pain. That's right. It feels identical. Yeah, it hurts. Many patients complain of, of I've got burning, it's acid that's coming up. I feel acid in my throat. But you can't distinguish the difference between whether it's acid or not acid. However, use of antacid medications will not help at all if it's, uh, if it's uh, alkaline in reflux. We okay. have a few things that will help there. So if, if somebody has pernicious anemia and has achlorhydria, no acid in their stomach, and has this, this complex are there other lab work that you need, Dr. Van Hooter? Well, I would ask for a uh, vitamin B12 uh, level, of course. Pari so, and a parietal cell antibody. antibody in the um, Pri yeah. A parietal uh, cell parietal antibody can be helpful here. So the parietal cells for the patients are those cells in the stomach that make acid. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about now is a disease that you make an antibody against these cells in your stomach that make acid, and you knock off your own uh, stomach's ability to make acid. 
We what can, else do we need to be well, doing? We can also study. do a B12 blood level. Yeah. Blood uh, level, yeah. Dr. Uh, Dehur? Well, most patients also have a combined anemia. They also have iron deficiency because you need acid to change the polarity of your iron in order to be resorbed. So you can, in fact, find a combined deficiency of vitamin B12 and, uh, and iron, which means uh, which can induce a very severe anemia. Okay. Anything else that we need to be doing to this guy? We have Dr. Maudlin, a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> no, that's a sheep in wolf's clothing. I can't, no, it's I can't, a gray-haired Maudlin. I can't tell if you're facing me or turned sideways. <laughs> Um, so far, the panel has spent about uh, $9,000 on, on PPIs, B12s, endoscopies, biopsies, and the diagnosis of ECL cell proliferation. If the panel got the patient to drink a glass of lemonade and took the blood levels of the gastrin at 0, 5, 10, and 15, or 20 minutes, uh, Dr. Ardell would tell you the patient does or doesn't have a gastrinoma. Uh, this is a very expensive way to find out a very simple answer quickly. Thank you. <laughs> I... Okay, Dr. Warner. <clears throat> I'll bring out my best weapon right up front. If you're going to neutralize the modelin, use a Warner. Lemonade can, why don't we do Chianti? I mean, at least, you know, we need something with acid. What, what is drinking a glass of lemonade going to have to do with the price of, of, of lemons? Well, first of all, the, the use of an acid diet involving lemonade was proposed uh, uh, by... Uh, Moses? Uh, no. Noah? <laughs> o o almost. Uh, yeah. Ber Berson and Yellow who invented the radioimmunoassay and did the first uh, really good investigations for gastrin, uh, discovered uh, that acid in the stomach would shut off gastrin production. And so it's a feedback mechanism. When you eat, you, the presence of the food substances stimulate gastrin and uh, gastrin then stimulates acid production, and then the acid goes out from your stomach, and it's a shut-off mechanism. It signals the body. Does, does that work in both uh, pernicious anemia and PPI-induced achlorhydria? In both instances, the absence of acid results in a chronic elevation of blood Yes, and if I give them acid, i.e., the proverbial lemonade test, will both of them respond the same way? Well, with lemonade, if you drink a lot of it and it's very strong, then you, in, then you reduce the pH, you may increase the acid in the stomach, and you can shut off uh, gastrin production. But it's not a practical diet. Very few people can use that as their sole beverage making uh, perhaps uh, uh, four, four lemons in each glass and drinking maybe uh, half a dozen glasses of that mixture every day and nothing else and avoiding all, all alkaline foods, uh, eating things that are pickled, lots of vinegar uh, and such substances. Lemonade for life, I can see it now. <laughs> Change we can live with, lemonade for life. I, I love it. The model in my, lemonade, would, for lemonade for life. <laughs> I'm proposing to the panel that you don't need $10,000 of investigations to see if there's an autonomous gastric source from a tumor. If you drink a glass of lemonade, it will absolutely, there will be two Nobel Prizes for this switch off gastrin and you'll know that you just have a G cell microplasia, ECL cell response system in the stomach. You don't have to do it. And it'll do the same thing for PPI. Absolutely. Okay. Read my book. What what do we do? 
That's the, the latest one, uh, Editor Hugh Hefner. Um, what, what do we do now? Uh, uh, Joy, what are, what are we going to do with this patient now? It looks like they have atrophic gastritis. It looks like they have pernicious anemia. Uh, we've done the lemonade test. And what do we do now? There's absolutely no necessity for them to be on PPIs then. Okay, we stop PPIs. Anything else that we need to do? Uh, can we just let this patient, do we put them on B12? Uh, if so, uh, is, is there anything Dr. Warner implied that if you took acid orally that that might help some of these people with their digestion? Anything else we need to be doing for somebody like this? Anybody well, propose... B12 replacement, obviously. Yeah. Anybody propose doing something to alter their gastrin level? Put these people on somatostatin analogs? Uh, do we take out their their uh, G cells by doing an antrectomy? Any role for any of that, Richard? Sandostatin or, or lanreotide uh, will suppress gastrin usually. And, and, and is there a, an advantage to suppressing the gastrin? Well, the, the question is, uh, the development of carcinoids in the stomach uh, will follow eventually uh, because of the uh, excess of gastrin stimulating the uh, overproduction of uh, the endocrine cells, which are not atrophic, as, is, as are the parietal cells. Odo, how often does that happen? I mean, do you, you get somebody, I, I don't see, obviously as a surgeon, I don't see the, the, that number of people with a, atrophic gastritis and achlorhydria. I mean, if, if, you've, if this person was 30 years old and is going to live 50 versus 60 years old and going to live 30 years, th does that make a difference in, in how you approach these people? Yes, it does, and it's very common. The so-called type 1 gastric uh, uh, carcinoid is the commonest, comprising approximately 60% of all the gastric uh, carcinoids. Fortunately, it's the least malignant, but eventually, after it's unknown how many years, but a good long time, uh, a certain small percentage can uh, exhibit true malignant features uh, spreading. Uh, and so if, especially in a younger person, uh, we want to avoid yeah. that long uh, uh, journey and the eventual uh, development of this condition. Also, uh, it is unclear as to whether chronic elevation of gastrin causes symptoms or not. I believe it does, but I don't know of any really satisfactory studies no. to uh, prove that. But the, the uh, point is that if you reduce the gastrin by one of the maneuvers available, and namely uh, administration of a somatostatin analog, acidification of the stomach, uh, or in some instances even resecting the antrum, which is a, a major, if not the sole source, of the gastrin, yeah. then uh, you can improve the situation. Yeah. And uh, one can see regression of the endocrine cell hyperplasia by repeated biopsying, and also, even if there are some residual small carcinoid nodules, you see them regress very often. Odo, you had a comment? Yeah, just if uh, Dr. Warner brings up a very important point in that the risk of, of uh, 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 exemplifying what Dr. Modlin warns about anecdotes, uh, if you go back to when they, we had pentagastrin for the diagnosis of medullary thyroid cancer, uh, when you give a bolus of pentagastrin, you, you get immediate flushing. And uh, Dr. Warner alluded to possibly some of the symptoms themselves due to the gastrin, which is very likely. But one of the things I was concerned about was the some of that uh, epidemiologic data that's looked at colon cancer uh, with... Uh, the work in, of in, Courtney Townsend yeah, with, and uh, Jim Thompson gastrin. from Ga uh, Galveston. Yeah, there are, I think, uh, and I could stand to be corrected, but colon uh, adeno cancers will have as much as 90% uh, re uh, gastrin receptors. And uh, I wonder always about the age of a patient with high gastrins for a long time 
and whether or not it, it is a very important physiologically trophic uh, hormone. Which brings my, my next question for the, for the panel. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a question that I'm asked a, by a lot by the patients, and I've got to say, you know, I, I worry about it, but I can't give anybody a real answer, is gastrin may be trophic or act like a growth factor for enterochromaffin cells or carcinoid cells. So if you take PPIs and you, you alkalinize your stomach and you now have high circulating gastrins for long periods of time, does, is there any evidence, and Dr. Mullen, if you have anything with your mastomy model or whatever, is there any evidence that if you have an ileal carcinoid, that taking proton pump inhibitors and raising your gastrin does anything to those cells? That's a good question. Irv, know. you have a comment? This is an archaeological discussion. An archaeologic uh, discussion. Well, uh, who well, best to lead it but somebody <laughs> who is older than dirt? Let me, let me put this in perspective for you. Firstly, the Mastomus model got a uh, uh, got a. The mastomy, by the way, is like a hamster-like thing, like a gerbil. It, it gets these tumors in the stomach if you give it PPIs. Now, the Mastomus model put the whole PPI problem to rest, and it was given a PhD by the King of Sweden for the services to Astra Hessler for this, right? Because the mastomy was, a, was. Yeah, yeah. It was an only animal ever to get a PhD. I, I, I took it on behalf of the. Oh, mastomy. okay. Um, the, I'm glad it wasn't a weasel. Can I, can I just finish my statement? <laughs> um, wh what I want to point out to you is, um, with all due respect, uh, Dick, off to the wonderful introduction you gave me, uh, PPIs have been in place now for almost 15 years. Um, there is no proven by rigorous or robust analysis of any causal relationship between a PPI hypergastrinemia and de developing a gastric carcinoid. Even if you did get a gastric carcinoid type 1, the only way you're likely to die of it is if you cross Park Avenue at midday with your eyes shut. <laughs> you, you, you don't die from that tumor. It's a benign tumor, okay? And the third thing, uh, apropos your ileal carcinoid, the ileal EC cells that give you the ileal neuroendocrine tumors do not express gastrin receptors. There is no impact of gastrin on the ileal EC cell. So the concept of gastrin as doing something uh, in the ileum is not borne out by scientific analysis. So I, I would put this discussion to rest. Okay. I was going to say that uh, autoimmune atrophic gastritis is really very common in people over the age of 45, a little bit more common in women. I think it's about 5% of the population. And it seems like sledgehammer, uh, the, the, the somatostatin analogs are not registered for treatment in these patients unless they would have a tumor that would be secreting. And okay. uh, I think we're down a strange avenue, maybe. All right. Um, this man has a repeat endoscopy, and it shows more mo small nodules, one to two millimeters in diameter. Uh, what else do we need to do? Uh, this guy, we, we've sort of figured out already, has uh, a, a, a atrophic gastritis and a, a pernicious anemia. Uh, if he has recurrent small carcinoids, Dr. Modlin has said nobody ever dies of these, but what, what about those people that have innumerable ones? At what point do you say enough is enough, Richard, and do you start treating him with somatostatin analogs? It, do you have to wait until the, those people have uh, so many small nodules that you can't resect endoscopically, or do you, do you try to be pro more proactive earlier? In answer to your question, there is no established consensus for the management of a patient like that at this time. It is a matter of opinion. My own practice is to start these patients once they've been diagnosed on a somatostatin analog. That's the first thing I do, and I usually treat them for at least three months and then re-biopsy, re-scope them, and see if I've got any regression. I also measure their chromogranin A and their, and their gastrin, 
And if they have really come down 40, 50 percent, I feel that we are making some progress. And we okay. then have two options. We either can continue this treatment indefinitely or we can talk about surgery. Surgery okay. for uh, doing antrectomy, usually laparoscopic, without going into the arguing point of uh, where the gastrin comes from, because in a large number of cases, most in our experience, in 27 out of 28 patients who had such surgery, the uh, gastrin, uh, gastrin normalizes. goes that normalizes yeah. and uh, they remain well, at least in the follow-up we've had now about Rod, six years. Rod, uh, have you done any of these cases? Have you done antrectomies for type 1? No, I haven't. Uh, do you and use what, somatostatin analogs? Well, one thing I want to ask, because I know Dr. Modlin had in a model quite some time ago that after a while, these, these tumors can come, become quite trophic independent of gastrin. Isn't that right? But, and so if you take out the antrum, you may not actually, that may actually actually be what's impacting the outcome. Yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Pomier's co comment. Uh, if, you, if you look at these cells, uh, and you, that you drive them with gastrin, and uh, that's, I agree with uh, Dr. Warner on that. But at a certain moment, a certain time point, uh, the cells become autonomous. Uh, and if you take the gastrin away completely, the cells keep proliferating. So taking out the antrum uh, is, uh, I mean, for me, it, it made sense about 25 years ago. But that's at the time when we did gastrectomies for peptic ulcer disease. Now we don't. So I, I, think, I think it was right, but it was right 25 years ago. So I Okay. Um, obviously, PPIs make no sense in this patient because he's already a chlorhydric, and oral iron does make sense, uh, but he has to have uh, B12 as well. Yeah, I would also just, and I think this had been brought up prior in a prior panel, but when uh, when you lose the acid, uh, you also lose the ability to absorb calcium which needs to be in acid as an ionized form for absorption. So that also, and this was observed in uh, some of Dr. Zollinger's cases where their vitamin D or their calcium levels started to drop without the, uh, without the acid. Okay. All right. Um, anything else that the physician should have picked up on earlier in this case? Um, there are associations for people who have these autoimmune diseases, yeah. that there's an association between anti-parietal cell antibodies, the development of anti-thyroid antibodies, the development of anti-melanin antibodies in a, in a skin dis, a disease called vitiligo, and actually anti-islet cell antibodies. So these people may have uh, evidence of diabetes as well. Um, let's see. Uh, Rod, how high of, of gastrin levels do you get with PPIs? Is, is there uh, a magic number? In the old days, when I was uh, at Ohio State, uh, Dr. Zollinger always used cutoffs of 200, 500, and 1,000 for gastrins and, and who has tumors and who doesn't. Do PPIs uh, give you gastrin levels of 1,000 or a 200 or 500? Joy, uh, Richard, anybody want to pop in here? The one thing I want to say is that gastronomas are very variable. So you could have a gastronome over a thousand, and you might be quite sure that that's a gastronoma, or you could have a gastronome over 20,000. We have a cutoff of, of 100. And I have seen about 25% of our gastronomas will only be one and a half times normal. So that's uh, into a range where we see lots of other people, uh, lots of other confusion with, with no acid in the stomach or with the patient having eaten uh, just before the clinic and not mentioned. And uh, so, so it's very difficult. There isn't a cutoff. There isn't an easy uh, concentration where we can say gastrin uh, is definitely in the tumor range. People who have autoimmune atrophic gastritis can have gastrins of 30,000. 30,000. 30,000. What about so PPIs? PPIs, it'll go up to about 250 maximum. A few patients more than that. But 
Rod, do you see people on PPIs who have gastrins I've seen above them 500? Is that a no, safe I've number? seen them anywhere between 1 and 300, or 1 and 500. 1 and 500. Yeah, so I've, I've had a if your gastrin is more than 500, it ain't PPI. It's considered a path mnemonic. Okay. Richard, do you agree with that? Which means Tom? <laughs> well, I think there are exceptions, but in general I would agree. Uh, I would be more interested in the level of the chromogranin A because we've seen chromogranin A's over a thousand yes. on PPIs, yep. and there was a very elaborate study approximately a decade ago by Sandra Lierno who uh, studied the elevation of chromogranin A sequentially in patients on PPI treatment over the years, and she found several, several patients on eight years of treatment who had values in the, in the 3,000 range. So uh, that it can go so, up. And it so that's not a big time. help. No. 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 So a, 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 there's not an absolute number that if it's over that, it's, it's ZE, or if it's under that, it's PPIs. And that's, that's right. And that's especially true as well if PA alone, pernicious anemia alone, where the gastrin rises, because you can see uh, uh, gastrin levels easily over 900 to 1,000 uh, with just the pernicious anemia part of it, the gastrin levels, that is. So okay. it, it, there's a spectrum in it. And the other thing we have to remember is that all of these things go up with renal failure or renal impairment. Yep. So and that, that's, that was my next question. Uh, you know, what about chromogranin? Is there a, a sort of a magic number there? Uh, I know that it all depends on, on which assay. Uh, you know, Mayo Clinic assay is 225 as normal. The Quest assay is 36. How, how high above baseline uh, can, can PPIs drive your chromogranin? Can it make it 10 times normal, 5 times normal? Well, well, I showed a patient yesterday that had a chromogranin of 100, uh, so, sorry, 1,200, and our cutoff should be 30, so that's way above. Okay, um, so it, it can drive we, we your chromogranin A sky high. Yeah. I, I certainly say at that level, we can see many of our patients have extensive disease. So 1,200, you're talking, you know, we expect that in patients who have quite extensive disease. So the false positives in that case is actually quite okay. significant, but uh, it can be occasional, yeah. Okay. We looked at uh, three and a half thousand consecutive uh, samples coming through the lab measured for chromogranin A, and 16% were over a thousand in the assay that we use, and one of those was because of proton pump inhibitors. So it's not common that it's going to be up in that range out there in the public, but you have to keep it in the back of your mind. And, and the one thing I'd like to point out with this next slide is Dr. Zollinger used to always say there were two critical points for having a gastrin-producing tumor, and that is, A, you had an elevated gastrin, but B, when you measured the acid in the stomach, you had to have acid. And, and that's one of the things, believe it or not, the gastroenterology community hasn't sort of figured out is buying a roll of litmus paper so they can, they can check the pH in your stomach uh, just somehow escapes the gastroenterologist, at least in New Orleans. I'm going to interrupt just for a moment because in Northern Ireland, which is only one point, uh, four million or whatever, we have had in the last 40 years that I've been working in this area, two patients with atrophic gastritis, elderly folk who have had a gastronoma. They've had no acid, they've had no syndrome, but they've had a gastronoma. Wow. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, let's see. 55-year-old female with a known carcinoid syndrome, flushing and diarrhea, presents uh, to your office with increasing abdominal pain. A CAT scan shows a mesenteric nodule that's five by five centimeters, has that stranding appearance that looks like a starburst, and has two liver metastases. One metastasis is peripheral in the right lobe of the liver, and the other is deep in the left lobe. No primary is known. Uh, what, do, what are the, the first kinds of things 
that that you would want as a, a radiologist, nuclear medicine physician? Are there any imaging things? We already have a CAT scan. Anything else that we want to be doing? Uh, the guidelines that we have in both the UK and Europe would suggest a stratostatin scintigraphy. Mm -hmm. That would be done either as an ocratized scan if you don't have gallium-68 dototate present or if you have the PET gallium-68, you do that. But one of the two should be done. The reason being, of course, is that we scan the patient from sort of head to foot. We'd also do tomography of at least the abdomen and liver and air area. Yeah. We might do additional sites of tomography. These days we try to do SPECT-CT because that improves our sort of ability to identify sites of tumor. Um, that would be in terms of imaging. There's other tests we might want to do as well. But I have to say that I'm slightly concerned about this mesenteric nodule and the stranding uh, because um, that would be something that we, particularly in the patient with abdominal pain, uh, as there's no other images, the other thing we will be looking at will be looking for signs of mesenteric ischemia. Now, that wouldn't be a nuclear medicine test. We'd be looking at other forms of imaging, including, if possible, MRA. Uh, we'd also be looking at the... MRA being a, mes uh, a magnetic right. resonance arteriogram, like an MRI, but done as an arteriogram to look at the blood vessel flow. We want to look at the quality of the, particularly the, the small bowel, because that tends to be most affected on the CT scan. Does it show evidence of edema? We would also may even need to go to a, a formal angiogram to look at both the uh, arterial and venous supply and venous return to see if there's any evidence of restriction. So that will be within our sort of scope of what we'll be looking on the imaging side. In, in Europe, Dr. Uh, De Herter, uh, would you do an MIBG scan in Europe? At no. this point, no. no. When when do you ever do an MIBG scan in Europe? Um, we do. I guess the Canadian group does does a fair amount of MIBG work. Yes, we do. We we do MIBG scans because it can be considered for a therapy. Yeah. And there's a certain proportion of patients who have negative uh, Ocri scans but are positive in MIBG. So, so that's, in Europe, that's, uh, that's not not. No. Uh, so I think two indications: pheochromocytoma and uh, Octreo scan negative patients. Octrea scan negative patients. Yes. But if you're positive, no. No. Uh, probably not now. I, I think we probably agree. With mid-gut cast noise, your incidence of positivity of MRBG is much higher. And I think our main use, as Walter said, is that we will be looking towards treatment with MRBG therapy. Uh, I would also say there's a slight caveat in the fact that recently there has been some evidence that treatments with radiopeptide therapy in patients with mesoteric ischemia doesn't always do well. Uh, partly because of, uh, we're not entirely sure why, it might be that in some of these patients we would consider the option, if possible, of MRBG therapy. So we might be more inclined to do MRBG imaging than we would have been maybe even two or three years ago. Okay. Uh, what now, Rodney, from your point of view, uh, we, we got an Octrea scan, maybe we got an MIBG scan, we have a CAT scan. Uh, known carcinoid, known syndrome, uh, anything you're going to do different at this point? Well, if I'm planning to operate on this patient to find and resect the primary, debulk the liver, and possibly do a mesenteric nodal resection, I want a little more history on the pattern of the pain. Is this pain that I can attribute almost solely to perhaps partial small bowel obstruction symptoms from the primary and the mesenteric mass really isn't contributing. Um, Richard, uh, or is it just let me interrupt. Hold, hold that thought for one second. If the patient had pain every time they ate, a half hour after they ate, 40 minutes after they ate, is there anything you'd be worrying about more than obstruction, let's say? Yes, indeed. Since approximately one quarter uh, or even more of these patients will have uh, ulcers, uh, gastric or duodenal ulcer. And therefore, if this symptom is present, uh, to that degree, I would certainly want an upper GI endoscopy. Okay. Uh, what about, Rodney, uh, people who, who have what's called intestinal uh, angina? Yeah, that's where I was going when, when you stopped me. Sorry. And that's all right. Um, I couldn't read your mind. At least I attribute that you have one. That's the good news. The, um, I, I, one of the hallmarks is food fear. Um, are these people afraid of eating? Have they been losing weight? And Food I, aversion. 
I, I find that that is not so much a problem. They'll sort of struggle through the cramping pain and these kind of crescendo, decrescendo waves that they get from the primary tumor being in there. But when it's, when it's the mesenteric mass, um, then in its intestinal ischemia, it is uh, a very different pain pattern. They're very afraid of food. They try to minimize what they eat, and they have been losing weight. And so I'm going to have to make some very critical decisions. As, as you've said in many of your presentations, the mesenteric mass resection is not surgery for the faint of heart. And um, yes, there are data that if we can get out the mesenteric mass, patients will do better, live longer. You can also just improve the situation while you're in there because if you can basically crack it open like a, like a coconut and sort of bivalve it, you can increase the blood flow again and relieve the intestinal angina without having to resect it entirely. So I think that's really important. You don't have to necessarily resect it to improve the blood flow to the bowel and keep the bowel from dying. That, that, that's really a critical concept. And a, and a sad thing that I see all the time is that surgeons open and close carcinoid patients because they see the lymph node and they say, I can't remove that, and they shouldn't if they don't have a lot of experience and, and, with it. And I think, let me just say that, that you heard it yesterday from Dr. Liu at Vanderbilt and, and today again from Dr. Uh, Pami. Don't criticize the guy who knows his own limitations, and he does what's called the peak and shriek. Takes one look and goes, ah! closes things back up. The peak and shriek is a totally appropriate response if, in, if you're in a fishing village at, you know, or a small town somewhere and you've never seen this, you've never done this. you got no business doing this. Yeah. Along okay. those lines, uh, and in terms of experience, um, I, I, I sh my shriek got rid of yeah, Dr. No, I, I would just like uh, I would just driving add that, rodents out yeah. of the room with I would just add that several noise. we have uh, several patients that come to us fire sorry they we have uh, several pa <laughs> we have several patients that come into us and have had their primary tumor removed and then when you start to ask them is your gallbladder still in many of them have their gallbladder still in and and uh, the endocrine uh, specialists like Rod and Dr. Liu know that the, the gallbladder should come out at the same time so you can avoid the, and the reason being that over time uh, cholelithiasis uh, prevails with uh, octreotide use which as I said yesterday is something that I think should be used in perpetuity on patients with mid-gut Dr. Carcinoma. Warner you had a comment uh, there are a couple points perhaps I missed uh, I think you mentioned an octreo scan was done, but I didn't hear the result of well, it. Well, no, he, uh, the, uh, our, our friends here, uh, Dr. Bascom, uh, asked for an octreo scan. I don't think I, I purported what it showed yet. Stay tuned. Okay. Patient has peripheral edema, complains of moderate shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion. Uh, is there anything else that we'd be worried about? What do we do now? Uh, so, uh, so I'm worried about carcinoid heart disease as well then, which is in line with the fibrosis suspected in the central mesenterial region. And, and Dr. Bascom, what's the best way from the radiologist's point of view, if I'm worried about carcinoid heart disease, to figure out it, it, does this patient's shortness of breath and dyspnea on exertion come from carcinoid or does it come from coronary artery disease or is it just bad luck and bad juju? Uh, well, I think it can actually be quite difficult to sort out. And I think that it's, um, it's a peripheral edema. Well, also, <coughs> the thing you have to worry about, you haven't got two problems going on because you could, still have, you could have carcinoid heart disease, which explains some of the symptoms. Um, you could also have dyspnea related, we don't know that in terms of how much the carcinoid syndrome the patient has, but you can get bronchospasm related to that, which could also cause some of the shortness of breath and dyspnea. Mm -hmm. But in addition, if you've got a large mass, which is again compressing, for example, the inferior vena cava, you can have edema due to just sheer compression of re vascular return. So I think you're going to have to quite carefully work through each one of those. Okay. Uh, what, what are the tests that I'm going to want to order at this well, point? Well, some of them hopefully you already got, because hopefully we've already done a decent quality CT. We may also have done an MR uh, angiogram. Do, do you want we would uh, do an a echo of the heart? Uh, we would want an echo of the heart, of course. And, and these days with modern echo, uh, particularly with our, our very gifted cardiologists, 
we can get a lot of information from an echo in terms of pressure changes, etc., and flow. So we'll get a lot of information with good quality echo, which would help us. But I said the main thing you've got to remember, the patients can be complex. You can't just look at one solution. You've got to make sure you've covered all your bases. Mm -hmm. Rod, for people who have carcinoid syndrome in your practice, who you have on octreotide or you don't have on octreotide, I'm sure you do, how often do you repeat the echo? Do you do it just once? Do you do it yearly? Do you do it every six months? How often is often enough to have a, 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 an echocardiogram? I get it certainly on every patient that has, the, that has syndrome or the potential for syndrome or known liver metastases uh, as a baseline. Um, if they're on octreotide, we just really haven't seen people get the carcinoid heart disease thereafter or even have it progress. You okay? And so um, I check them for symptoms. I, you know, when I'm examining them, I, I listen to their heart for murmurs. I uh, examine them for edema and ask them about their exercise tolerance and, and things like that. And if there are no changes in that, I do not repeat the echocardiogram. Dr. DeHerter, how often do you do it? Well, let me first be more specific. Um, I think every patient with especially mid-cut carcinoids uh, should at least undergo echocardiography once in their life. Um, carcinoid heart disease is quite prevalent. Between 50 and 60 percent of patients have some damage to the heart falls, which doesn't mean that this is clinically significant. So I think we need to discriminate between yeah. clini clinical significant carcinoid heart disease and just some um, damage to the right side of heart falls. Okay. As you know, uh, in, a, in a city where uh, IV drug abuse is very common, a lot of these guys have uh, damaged right heart falls and have no problems with, uh, with regard to heart failure. So there's also the fibrosis of the heart itself that uh, causes this heart disease. Okay. One way of looking at it, some centers have done that, is looking at a parameter called NT-ProBMP, which is a marker. It's brain natriuretic peptide. It's a marker of heart failure. And uh, some studies show that it's a marker that very good correlates with heart failure. So, so is that ANP or BNP? It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah, matter. ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, or BNP. BNP. It's, it's more or less the same. Yeah. More or less the same. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. the BNP is better, and we usually measure pro-BNP. It's just pro what's, a, okay. what's available. But I would suggest that the fibrosis around the tumor in the mesentery, the fibrosis in the heart is caused by the circulating peptides. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, so we need to know what the urinary 5 HIA is, and we also would like to know what the tachykinins are, because in order to control uh, the situation, we want yes. to be able to Could lower these. Speed. Okay. Can I, just a comment, uh, and along the lines of the heart disease, uh, Mayo uh, published uh, a very important uh, paper or two. The first paper divided in years their heart disease, uh, their valve disease, right-sided valve disease, and the surgery on them is, is groups A, B, and C. And I think they used decades of life in between group A, group B, and group C. What was happening from group A was it was just uh, pre, not quite peri, uh, octreotide. And then group B started to see, you started to see the peri, the octreotide in the United States, which was about 19, it came in the United States in 1989, it was FDA approved. Then they had group C. One of the observations was the number of referrals for right-sided heart disease or valve disease had dropped off. And initially they said, well, it's, it's really, uh, I think they said surgical technique and excellence, they looked at survival. But then they finally came up with the paper that really clearly showed that it was probably the impact of octreotide in the patients. The other thing that Dr. Ardill alluded to was they based it on 5-HIA levels. And they showed initially that 5-HIA levels of over 350 would predict very much uh, the, uh, predict, uh, the right-sided heart disease. And that, the, as you heard yesterday and today, or yesterday, serotonin is the major product, uh, is the major contributor to the 5-HIA formation. 
Uh, there's probably another hormone, substance P probably contributes as well. But really serotonin, we saw beautiful slides in that knockout uh, animal where the heart is almost dissolving when they don't have serotonin uh, receptors. So I think serotonin is the culprit and the levels have dropped significantly and I think a 5-HIA can at least tell you if you're prone to it and uh, using levels now that are 250 or more to predict uh, right-sided heart disease, but uh, okay. we're just not seeing it. I'm not seeing can it. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Can I ask the surgeons a question? I always understood that um, uh, inferior caval vein obstruction um, will not be uh, that important course because it goes so slowly that patients will develop collaterals. And uh, so we don't see that often. Is that true or not? No, I what, see it. What that means is if one no, of the... I, I disagree. I, I agree with Rod yeah. that, that we do see patients with peripheral edema due to vena cava obstruction. All the time. So yeah, the vena that, cava is not as... Uh, it's the big vein that comes back from the lower half of the body and it runs through the liver before it goes into the heart. It's about the size of a toilet paper roll there. And if your liver tumors get big enough, it will crush the vena cava and the blood can't get through. And patients basically get swollen from the belly button on down. And, and those it's, are the patients oftentimes who spend a lot of time relatively sedentary so they, they lay back in their lazy boy recliner lounger and all the weight of their gut plus their tumor now blocking yeah. ref, uh, reflow from the legs makes it worse. How do we know uh, from uh, any of you guys, when's the time that we need to do a valve replacement? This patient, do we medically manage this patient? And, and how, how bad does this have to get before uh, we're going to redo the valves? I have to say, I mean, traditionally we always used to think of this as a, as a very significant operation. We wanted patients to have significant symptoms that we would then obviously improve in terms of risks and benefits. But I think our, now that the way that the cardiothoracic surgeons replace the valves and the way that the patients actually recover afterwards, this has whole changed because patients can now go through two or three valve replacements with really minimal morbidity and they recover very quickly. And I think we've actually, again, seen a sea change in the fact that we now more aggressively replace the valves. And what we've actually seen, a lot of patients that we thought were just ill because they had metastatic tumor, they were losing weight, they had a lot of peripheral edema, uh, and they were just not having a good quality of life. And despite the fact we treated them with various things, chemotherapy, radiocline therapy, embolization, they just didn't seem to do well. And we've replaced their valves, and they've actually just turned around. I remember one woman who couldn't walk more than about six meters, appalling quality of life. And within literally three weeks of valve replacement, her life had just been transformed, and she remains very well three years later. So I think that we probably need to be more aggressive in looking at valve replacements. Once we know these valves are damaged and the patients are starting to get symptomatic, I think we need to look at their valve replacements early and not later. So. But that give you a little <laughs> interim summary. <laughs> Valve disease is relatively rare in the age of octreotide uh, and those people who are aggressively managed with octreotide. But when you need a valve replaced, when you are symptomatic, it needs to be done and it needs to be done quickly. And, and it may not just be symptomatic. I mean, my question is, can I get you through a major abdominal operation? And so my cardiac surgeon jokes that I'm his third leading source of referrals. And um, so um, the case That's that better than being the third leading cause of, of death. death. Yes. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about the third leading cause of death later, perhaps. Um, but, uh, and and that, that's why I think getting an echocardiogram can be life-saving. And so, as, as Voucher said, you know, it may not be clinically significant when you're walking around. It can be really clini clinically significant on the operating table when you're bleeding. Yeah. And I had one gentleman, you know, now that Irv has left, we can tell anecdotes again. Um, <laughs> Is that a high-frequency high screeching voice of Waldring that drove I, him out? I had a 77-year-old man who was a marathon runner with carcinoid, and I, he had an occult primary, and he had um, uh, a debulkable liver. And I thought, man, if ever there's a gentleman who doesn't need an echocardiogram, it, it would be he. And then I knocked myself and I said, stick to your protocol. And about an hour later, I got a call from the cardiologist that said, holy moly, we've never seen a heart like this. I said, yeah, really strong. I said, no, worst carcinoid disease ever. 
And he, um, he had very bad fibrosis of his heart, very bad tricuspid, the first valve on the right side, uh, regurg, and very bad pulmonary valve where the blood gets out of the heart going to lung stenosis. And I said, the man runs marathons. I said, oh, yeah, he's fully compensated. The disease has progressed. He runs and gets his heart up to condition. It progresses more. He runs. I said, but he's at the edge of the cliff. He will not be able to compensate one iota. Okay. Uh, let's, because uh, we're getting close to time. Uh, the patient uh, decides that uh, an, an attempt is going to be made at surgically resecting her. She has an octreotide uh, drip protocol instituted pre-op. They take out her ter uh, a terminal ileal primary that they find. They take out her gallbladder. Intraoperative ultrasound shows only the two liver mets. I guess the question that I have here is, it, would you do the third part of the trio rod, would you take out the liver mets uh, along with the ileum, along with the gallbladder, along with this nodal dissection, or is, is, are you better off splitting this into two operations, do the nodes and the primary tumor, and come back another day to the, do the liver? It takes tremendous judgment. I very frequently will do a primary tumor resection in the, in the small bowel and a liver resection in the gallbladder all at once. Um, if the nodal dissection gets large, they take a long time, the patient's getting intravenous fluids the whole time, things start swelling up, that's not the best time to do a liver. And that's, I think, where what we learned. When we first started doing this, we did primary tumors, nodes, gallbladder, and liver, and we would do 16, 18, 20-hour operations. Now, granted, we have two teams. We have Dr. Wang, Dr. Goudreau, and they spell one another off, but we, we found that sometimes discretion is the better part of valor, that you're better off breaking it into two five-hour operations rather than one 10-hour operation. Uh, okay. Uh, I think that's where we have to be humble and say it's never a mistake for us to split an operation in two. Yeah, and, and it is not, you know, as, as the old surgeons used to say, you know, uh, the bad news about being on call every other night was you missed half the great cases. And it was a sign of weakness if you ever said you wanted a day off. You know, the, the surgical judgment to take a procedure and make it into two procedures because the day is getting long, the patient, you're worried about their stability, et cetera, is not a sign of weakness. It can be a sign that your surgeon is experienced in, in these kind of cases. I mean, I think if also if you're, you're concerned about that, you want to think, well, I don't want to leave the liver completely untreated. There are all sorts of local options to control liver disease, like embolization or chemoembolization or surspheres or even RFA, which enable you to hold the liver disease whilst you get everything else sorted out, and then you can go back later and treat it. So it's never, you're never in a situation where I think you should be forced into thinking you have to do something that's not optimal. Okay. Uh, the time has come that, that I was, Maureen told me that everybody needs to go out and, and have a quick break. Uh, the uh, cookies and goodies have been brought in. So we'll stop this and uh, resume after about a 15-minute